Well, good, man. And Mike, it's great having you on the show. So we can jump right into it because uh, obviously I was on your podcast and I uh, got to know you and you got to know me. And I want to jump right into talking about how you became successfully unemployed. So tell us a little about yourself, Mike. I was in the automotive industry for a number of years. I actually, when I was in high school, you know, I always tell people the playbook that was given to me as a young adult of what life, what you should aspire to do and be and, and how you should conduct yourself was written by, and nothing wrong with it, but by blue collar, union, factory working, good, hardworking people, right? But to them, the ultimate goal was to get into a company that has a union, right? So you're safe and you have benefits, work there for 30, 35 years, take all the overtime that they will give you, beg and plead for that overtime, work it all, grind yourself to a nub. This wasn't part of the, the, of the, of the pitch, but <laughs> grind yourself to a nub until you're in your early, late, early to mid sixties. And then you retire and hope you can have enough money scraped together to sort of get by. Like that was kind of it, right? It was loving. And it was, it was, they were trying to do what's best for me, my parents, but that's what was, that was my playbook. There wasn't anybody like, with the Hubble telescope, I couldn't have seen anyone in my sphere that was an entrepreneur that had anything to do with running businesses or was advising me on anything else. Right. So right out of high school, I got a job at UPS. Great company, great benefits. It's the Teamsters. My dad could not have been more ecstatic that the Teamsters <laughs> like he's like, I wanted you to get in the UAW, but the Teamsters are even better. Right. And so I thought I'm going to be here the rest of my life. And, and I didn't go to college. And uh, by the time I was 24, I had screwed my back up so badly from lifting boxes and things that I had to go to a chiropractor three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, just to get out of bed in the morning. Like I literally couldn't get up without going to a chiropractor. So I, I realized I wasn't dumb enough to realize that I could do that. I couldn't do that the rest of my life. So I uh, looked into the automotive industry, got a job in the automotive industry. It was a desk job. It was an inside sales kind of a job. And I, once again, I thought, this is it. This is where I'm going to be for the rest of my life. I love this company. And, you know, things happen. And, and back when in 2000 or right after 2000, when tech crashed, so did the automotive industry, went completely in the garbage and people were losing jobs left and right. And luckily I didn't lose my job, but I was self-aware enough. And by the way, being raised by a Marine, if nothing else, makes you very self-aware and very, very capable of criticizing and looking critically at yourself. And so I realized I wasn't a I was a commodity. I wasn't anything special. I didn't have an education. I had very little experience. I was young. Like I wouldn't even hire me if I were to be in the position to hire. So, right. So if I wouldn't even hire me, I've got to do something. Went back to school, got my degree as an adult with kids and a mortgage and all that. Got my degree. Great. Doubled my income. As soon as I got my degree, I, I switched companies, doubled my income. And I thought again, third time in my life, this is where I'll be the rest of my life until I got into it and realized after a few years, the automotive industry, while wonderful and gives us great cars and people love it, and I, I get it, it's for a lot of people. It was killing me. It was it was just it was eating my soul from the inside out, and I was miserable. And so I started, like a lot of us do in my early 30s, looking for an escape hatch. Like I was like, how do I get out of here? I have kids. I have a mortgage. I can't just quit. I'm responsible. I still have you know my upbringing in my head. You know, you need security. You need stability. Like it's fine. I get it but I have to figure out a way to take what money I do have and and multiply it, right? And, and somehow amplify that money. And I started looking at stocks in the stock market and day trading was a big kind of a, a buzz, you know, buzz thing back then. The reality was I hate it. And I don't have patience for reading how to invest in stocks and looking over stocks. I just, I hate it with every, I hated it more than I hated going to work. So I was like, all right, this isn't for me, right? I, I would be looking up things about stocks and reading things. And next thing you know, I'm on ESPN.com and NFL.com and I'm reading sports stuff. And I'm like, obviously I hate this. But when you research investing and how to invest and how do I invest my money and how do I retire early? At some point, real estate will come up, right? So I hit real estate and started reading about investors and how they invest and flipping and and I fell in love. Like I loved it. I was, I was, I couldn't get enough. Like I was insatiable reading. And I'll be honest, like a lot of us do when we get started, reading success stories was like a drug kind of, you know what I mean? Like I was just like reading it going, oh my gosh. And just kind of imagining how that would be. And, and I got really into it. I started going to conferences and I started going to meetups locally, but here's what I did. And, and this is probably the most important thing I can say in this entire conversation that we're going to have. I decided in 2003, I wanted to be a real estate investor. I put my stake in the ground and said, this is me. This is what I want. I am committed to this. Didn't buy my first house until 2008, five years later. 
I procrastinated. I had analysis paralysis. I was thinking of all the things that could go wrong, not the things that could go right. I had a very limited mindset, a very scarcity mindset. Like I was just, I was keeping myself insulated, but I was going to meetups. I was going to conferences. I was reading books. I was listening to things on the internet. And so sometimes when we're starting off, we can fool ourselves that we're in the game because we're kind of immersed in it, but we're not making offers. We're not getting deals, right? And it, and it wasn't until, and I swear, I, I, hope, I hope everyone isn't this way, but for me, and I think a lot of people are, I'm more motivated by pain than pleasure, unfortunately. And so the analogy that I like to give is, I think most people will run faster away from a bear that's chasing them than they will toward a pot of gold. And I know a lot of people may say intuitive, oh no, I wouldn't, I would love to get a pot of gold. Trust me, you're gonna run faster when you feel like you're gonna be eaten and mauled to death. And I needed to get to the point in my brain where like the stock, reading about stocks was more painful than going to work. I needed to get to a point in my brain where I was more disgusted with my procrastination and fear than you know, going to work wasn't better than the way I felt about myself every day when I woke up. And that's when I made my first you know, couple of offers and got my first deal. That is terrific because I completely agree in that uh, basically the entire thought process of we start getting too much in our heads and we get the analysis paralysis. We even just start overthinking things and don't start doing, you know, it'd be like practicing your entire life for a sport and never actually playing a game. Well, you're not necessarily an actual you know, athlete, you know, so you got to actually do it. And so what got you over that hurdle to actually do it? Was it something like a book you read? Was it all, you know, hey, this just happened to work out. This is a good deal. Let me put an offer. What got you over that hurdle? Uh, neither. It was a little more organic and a, and a little more slow building. It was kind of like a, a pot of water you put on the stove and turn it on high, right? That, that cold pot of water was me in 2003. And the bubbling pot where the water's bubbling over, that was me in 2008. It just, it got to a point where, again, I referenced that I was raised by a Marine, right? Jokingly said, you always are aware of your faults when you're raised by a Marine. So also in my family growing up, for better or for worse, right? This is maybe isn't the way it happens nowadays and maybe it's not supposed to happen this way, but we fear wasn't tolerated. Like if you were afraid, you acted like you weren't because if, they, if my dad knew you were afraid, you were going to do the thing you were afraid of inevitably. And so I was raised that way. I was raised to be a little intolerant of fear, okay? All boys in my family raised by a Marine. It was a very testosterone heavy uh, family. And, and I just got to a point where I, and here's the key too. In 2003, I didn't tell all my friends and family, I want to be a real estate investor. I didn't post it online. I didn't make myself accountable. I kept it all up here. I kept it in my head. And so by 2008, I was, I was rotting from the inside because of my fear and doubt and procrastination. I just started feeling bad about myself. And it was like this slow boil to, I got to a point where I was like, I can't live with this fear, this uncertainty, this putting off. I can't keep talking about how I hate my job, but then on the other hand, not doing anything about it. Like all the things that I sort of rail on people now for, because I get it, I, I don't I don't be, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm just not sympathetic of that. I'm empathetic, I get it. I get where they're feeling that I can totally understand, but I don't sympathize because I don't wanna be an enabler of people making excuses not to change things. If you're not happy with something in your life, your weight, the way you look, your job, your money, your wife, your husband, your whatever, you need to do something about it and not just complain. And I got, I got to the point where I was telling myself this, like, man, you are, you are just afraid. You're being completely ridiculous. Like you're miserable with yourself because you're not doing it. What's the worst thing you can have? You do it and fail. At least you have clarity. At least you tried, right? And so I just got to the point where I couldn't live with myself. I couldn't get up in my, and look in the mirror. I couldn't complain to my coworkers, to my wife, that I wasn't happy in my job. Like I knew that I wasn't doing anything. And I was, I really was like disgust. Like I was disgusted with myself, honestly. <laughs> so was that first deal a flip? Was it a wholesale deal? Was it a rental property? Yeah, it was a flip. Uh, at the time, um, that's all I really knew. I didn't even know what wholesaling was. I knew what rentals were, but I, I knew that I didn't want slow drip. I wanted influx of cash, right? I wanted bigger paydays. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I was watching all these flip or flop kind of shows. I mean, back then they were different. Now you have Chip and Joanna and it's a feel good story and everything's beautiful and everyone gets along and no one yells. Back then there was a guy named Armando Montalongo I saw or something, him. Yes, right? I remember him. This guy we watched, like he was a hothead. He drove this this obnoxious like you know vehicle and 
and, and he was just like, he just yelled at his con like everything was like stress, right? But I was watching it to try to glean. And then I joined a, a local um, three day like workshop of a local guy who was sort of successful in real estate. So we did a flip. And back then it was 2008 going into 2009 when we bought the house. And I'm in Michigan and Michigan in 2008, 2009, like, oh man, prices were down everywhere. But if you could imagine, like if you're listening in some state where, you know, the median house price is, is three quarters of a million dollars, get ready. I'm going to blow your mind. I bought a house for 40,000 and it wasn't like a house in a war zone. This was a house in a nice, clean, blue collar neighborhood, three bedroom, thousand foot brick ranch with a basement and a two, two bathrooms. I mean, it was, it was a nice little house and we put 15,000 in, in renovations. And, you know, we learned a lot. And if you're interested, we can talk about lessons learned on that first one. But at the end of the day, we made $15,000 in profit once we sold it and everything, you know, it was accounted for net profit, 15,000. And my wife grew up poor. I grew up very middle class. Like we didn't have tons and tons of money. I had never seen $15,000 at one time ever in my life. It was like winning the lottery. And my wife is super risk averse, super risk averse and super careful with money. Okay. Put it that way. Super careful. But when, when she saw the proof and I saw the proof and we sort of understood the process, we were both like, go, 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 like all systems go. Right. And I just started making offers like a madman. And we kind of went from there. I love that story. I love how you really got into it and figured out that because if you started thinking, everybody would realize that the crash happened in 2008, 2009. So if you start picking up properties after the crash, so much better. I started investing in 2006 and so started buying properties for rental properties. And even though the value literally was cut in half on uh, some of my properties, I was still making passive income. So I'm still fine. In fact, I still own them right now. But if, man, if you were flipping from 2005, 2006, and then hope, oh, I could see that. But I definitely, you got in at a better time and obviously successful now. Now tell me about this market now. We're knowing this is 2022, and it's it's definitely a seller's market, lot, uh, low inventory. If we were to buy a house now, is there anything that we should be looking for, like lower priced homes? Like, are we using the 70% rule? Like, can you walk me through if I want to flip a house now? What's the best way to get started? So he, I will say this, okay? People ask me, and I'm sure they ask you all the time, who are not in real estate, how's the market, right? How's the market, okay? Here's the deal. Here's my little rant on the market. The market is always great. It's always great. It's great for somebody all the time, right? It's as investors, it's how we position ourselves. It's how we adjust and adapt to the market that determines whether or not we're successful. So the market is never your problem. It's always how you're, how you're reacting or how you're adjusting your business model to it, right? And so in a seller's market, yeah, inventory is a little lower. It's a little more competitive. People know they can sell for more. It gets a little more challenging on the buy side, but the sell side it's fantastic, right? If you're flipping houses, like you're back in the, when you reference like 2005, 2004, 2003, I used to go to these meetups, like I said, and one of the strategies that people taught openly, like with confidence and with a straight face was buy a house for retail, sit on it for two years and sell it. Like that was a strategy, right? We were, we were banking on appreciation hundred percent. Those people obviously probably got burned at some point, but in this market today, I'm not saying you should do that, but you could almost do that. Or at the very least, you could buy it higher than you really would be comfortable three years ago and, and feel good that the, the prices are going to be there, right? I don't suggest that. But to answer your question a little more specifically, how would I go about it? Here's what I tell people who I coach and mentor all the time. Even in this market, my company, and I run an active real estate company. I'm not just talking theory. Like we're doing this every day. We buy 100 properties a year. We've had, we've had higher profit years the last two years than we did pre-pandemic. And there's a number of reasons for that that are a little bit of a tangent, not directly into the question you asked. But the point is, there are, we buy as investors, we don't buy from people whose houses are in top shape and they have nothing but time to sell it and there are no rush and there's no urgency and there's no motivation. They just wanna sell maybe sometime. We never buy from those people. Those folks are gonna be on the MLS for sure. But there are always people who have divorce, death, inheritance, job transfer, 
tax deferred uh, CapEx expenses that are just beyond what they can possibly deal with. There's always life situations that creates motivation that allows us to go in and buy properties at a deep discount while solving real problems for people. So when we go to the closing table, if you're listening to this as an outside and maybe not an investor, or you're very new, you might think, oh, wow, so you're taking advantage of people who are in a bad situation. Guess what? We get hugs. We get thank you letters. We get calls crying, thanking us and telling us that God sent us to them and we answered the, their prayers because their problem isn't getting another 10000 for their house. Their problems are something else. And we solve their problems. And as a result, we're able to buy their house at a price that makes sense for us, right? So it's a good thing. But people always have those life issues that allow us to buy. Now, are more people choosing to try their luck on the MLS who maybe before were kind of in that gray area where they're motivated, but not in a lot of pain right now. And so they have maybe three or four months that they could wait. Sure, they're going to the MLS right now first, and some of them are selling them just fine. But what happens when in this market is people go to the MLS because they have three or four months and they blow three months of that three or four months. And when they come back to us because they couldn't sell because the house was in shambles or there was some other issue going on, they're now they're ultra motivated, right? And so we're able to find these deals. It's harder, I'm not gonna lie. It's harder than it was but it's still doable. In this market, speed is everything. In a market like 2008, man, I could just take a, a gun and shoot fish in a barrel. It was so easy to get deals. Like it was really was a matter of how many can I handle at once, right? Now it's not really like that, but speed kills, okay? It's a boxing term, right? Speed kills, but it also applies to business. If you can get in there, get your offer in, get that contract before your competitors, you'll do much, much better. I have a friend of mine who runs a really successful real estate investing company. And when I was new, he was sort of mentoring me and he said, a company like me, I'm successful, I make a lot of money, but the fact of the matter is I have more moving parts than you do. So when I receive a call, it goes to our call intake, then it goes to maybe a salesperson and they have to pre-qualify and then they call back and then we set an appointment. If you get a call, set an appointment and get there that afternoon, you will most likely beat us most of the time. So speed can compensate for maybe a very competitive market. You just have to be fast. I hear investors all the time tell me, oh yeah, I, I'm getting some leads and I got some calls. I haven't called back yet. They called me on Monday, it's Wednesday. I'm like, what? Or I saw this deal come through my, you know, my, across my desk and from a wholesaler and it looked like a really good deal, but I was busy. And so I was gonna go make the offer after work and it was already sold. I'm like, speed, man, speed. You have to be more aggressive. Especially like you're right in this market right now where it's a seller's market, People who are investors or flippers or even wholesalers, like they get properties under contract very fast. Those are the ones that actually win. Those are the ones that actually do well is who move quick. Now, let me give you an example. So there's a property that at, at my church, I was talking with uh, uh, some, some people and an older lady said, oh, Dustin, you're an investor. My brother-in-law, like literally it just happened. My brother, my brother just passed away and I have his house. He has to go through probate. Would you be interested in buying it? I'm like, yeah, I'd be interested in buying it. And as I'm talking to her, she's wondering how much would she be able to get for it by selling it to a flipper? You know, I'm rental properties. I want to buy it long term, hold on for her passive income. And she was asking me, well, how much if I were to sell it to somebody who would flip it, how much would I be able to sell it for? So let me run that by you. What are your thoughts? Because I know what I would buy it for a rental property, like how much I can afford, how much it's going to cost to fix up, all that sort of stuff. Now, let me give you the whole scenario. Let's say you... She thinks that she can sell it for right around three four hundred thousand dollars, anywhere from three to four hundred thousand dollars. There was a house. Oh, this house sold for four hundred thousand dollars because it was flipped and it's beautiful on the inside. Now she's looking. She owes a hundred thousand. No, no. Uh, what I'm giving you, sorry, everybody listening. Um, I'm giving you the insights into uh, the conversations that we have as investors with uh, sellers. And so the seller is saying, well, I have these needs because as an investor, if we don't listen to their needs and we just go after what we want, you're not going to get the deal. We want to, like you said, Mike, you hit the nail on the head. We help people. People need to get out of certain things. Like maybe this lady that I'm working with, she's a super nice lady, but she doesn't want this drag on her. It's not a, it's not a great for her. She She's not an investor. She doesn't want to do that stuff. She just wants to get out of it. So I'm there to help yeah. her. Now, here's the thing. She owes $90,000 on the house. It was a re reverse mortgage for this property. The brother was taking the money out. Now there's $90,000 loan. And at the same time, she's seeing Zillow is selling it for $240,000 or the, the value, Zillow's quote unquote value. 
is two hundred forty thousand dollars. How would you proceed? She's saying, I think I could they could fill it, flip it, and be four hundred thousand dollars. She owes ninety, and you know, for give her the loan. And Zillow saying two forty. So those are all the scenarios. How would you approach that? I mean, there's a couple of things I want to know. Is four hundred real? Like, do I know if that's real, or am I just taking her her opinion? On you. That? I, there is one house that sold for right around four hundred thousand. That was completely like gutted. Comp, completely, yeah. yeah. Okay. But this so house is definitely. The, uh, oh, one Grandma's thing I house. didn't tell you: about a hundred thousand dollars worth of work. If you're going to flip it, it's, okay. it's, it needs a lot of work. Yeah, if I was going to flip it, and she thought it was worth two forty, to me that and and again, it, it it sounds like a weird question, but I have to ask: How old of a person are we talking about here? And and how isolated is she from her family, or does she have support? Like. What, what's Great this question like? Yes, those are fantastic questions. She's about, I want to say about 70, 73, okay. probably. Okay. Um, there's nobody else in, in her life. Her kids are moved away and it's really just her. And she has had a rental property in the past. She moved out of one and rented it out. But she's like, yeah, I'm just done. I don't want to have, I just want to get rid of it. I don't want to have to have, think about it anymore. So I'm a little more careful in this case. And, and it's because I, I want to be a good person more than I want to be rich, right? So- to me, though, I, I would ask her what she wants. What do you want? What would make you happy, right? And if she says two forty-five, I don't know if that's what she would say, but to her, that's the high water mark. Okay, we we can for a minute, if we believe four hundred, we we can set that aside. Two forty-five or whatever you said, two forty is the high water mark. I would ask her what she thinks is fair. Okay, and let's just run a scenario. If she says, "Well, if I could just get what I owe, I'd be happy," I'm not saying she said that. But if she said that, I would not pay her what she owes. That's way too low, and it's that's that is a that is a predatory kind of a, a way of looking at this. But let's just say I ran my numbers and I, my maximum allowable offer, let's just say, was 200, just, just for example, right? And if I said, what, do you, what would make you happy? What do you think is fair? What do you want to get? And she said, if I could get, you know, 150, I would be happy because my house needs a lot of work. Uh, I would probably, in that case, give her more than 150 somewhere between my you know my 200 or whatever i said and 150 we probably would end up in the 175 range because i want her to feel like she got what she wanted and more but i still you know if i if every deal we walked into that was like a killer deal for us if we just gave away all of our equity like that's that's a little bit ridiculous too right i want her to feel like she wins and especially if she's an old lady with no family no support no one who's going to run she can run this by to check that she's okay with this I'm going to err on the side of giving her even more than she wanted a little bit. So she, she feels real, real great about it and, and move on. And I think that would, I mean, just, we're talking very high level now, right? We haven't, I haven't gotten into the details. Like, is there a foundation problem? Foundation can be wildly different in price, right? But in general, if my number said I could pay 200 and that's a good deal for me and she wanted 150, we'd probably end up somewhere in the middle. Now, this, this is just the way I, operate but if this was a 40 year old man with and he was fully aware and he had family and he was he knew you know all this stuff and he said he wanted 150 we might try to get it for 130 because in that case i feel like i'm negotiating with someone who has the ability to completely make this decision and and we do try to get better deals than than what even that we think we can get if we can but I, we routinely with older folks, and we deal with mostly with older folks, by the way, I don't deal with a lot of 40 year old men. I deal with mostly 60 plus old people. Um, but we've had people want, and I'll tell you a short story to illustrate what I think, it, what we need to do as investors more often. I hired a salesperson like month one, he was new. He didn't know anything about real estate. He was great at sales. And so I would figure out the maximum allowable offer. I'd give it to him before he went to the appointment. I would say, get it for this or less, right? And he would call me if he had questions, like on the appointment, like, hey, I went in there and it's like, the furnace is in a weird spot. Like, does that, how do I even account for that? And so we would talk through it, right? But he was so good at sales, he could get great prices, even with limited knowledge of real estate. And by the way, if you're hiring a salesperson, do not necessarily sort for real estate experience it, it almost doesn't matter but he called me one time and he said hey i'm in this house it's an older lady like really old she has no family her husband's deceased and she has no idea what this house is worth like she it's it's free and clear like she only wants like twenty thousand dollars this thing's worth like 180 like we could probably sell it for 200 right she only wants twenty thousand dollars she he goes what do i do and i said you want to be able to look at yourself when you wake up in the you morning. Sleep at night, so yeah. Figure out what our max offer is, maybe drop it down a little bit 
and come to something that that we sort of win and she really wins because we were ne- our max allowable offer on the house i think it was like 75 80 thousand right she wanted 20 because she didn't she's like i don't know it's twenty thousand too much kind of an attitude and i said dude i understand your sales you want to crush it i get it he was a super aggressive young sales guy and i said you have to like let's i mean not to get like religious but let's just let's, let's just think about your eternal soul for a minute here is it where are you going to trade that for 50 grand like dude, it's just not worth it. And if you don't believe in that, just like, if you just don't want to feel like you're a piece of garbage, like don't, don't take advantage of old people. Don't take advantage of anybody, but certainly not people who are incapable of really like understanding what you're doing. So with older folks, we sometimes pay a little more, honestly, if they're kind of like on their own and, and, you know, we, we do a little differently, but you know, if we're buying from someone who's like ready to negotiate with us and they're like close to the vest and they got this and we'll negotiate kind of hard and we'll get houses a little, little cheaper than maybe even we thought we would get them. So I don't know. It's like a long convoluted answer, but I just think it's important that we don't treat everyone exactly the same. If someone is vulnerable, we're way more cautious and we we tread much more lightly and we think really, really hard about what we're doing and what we're offering so that if ever this came back, we would feel very good about what we did and we would have no problem explaining ourselves. Right. I mean, you should never take advantage of anybody. I'm just going to say that. But we're real careful with older folks. I, I love that perspective too. And as I'm talking with her, I'm also trying to educate her as well, helping her to understand what she could get, not because I want the property. I would be great to have it, but if she is trying to sell it for more than I can afford, then, Hey, that's over my top dollar. Let me help you out. I'm a friend. You know, I, I want to help you. I want to see you be better off than when I met you. So I, I love that. Now you've mentioned running the numbers to make sure that you're going to be making money. Cause there are things that people don't like when there's a flipping, you don't really, you watch a TV show that's, you know, flipping, you don't see like carrying costs. You don't see um, uh, realtor fees. You don't see a lot of expenses. So if you're going to run numbers, how do you make sure that you're running it right? Maybe give us any somewhat specific examples of how we can run numbers, right? So I give this formula out when I, when I give talks or presentations or whatever, so we don't use the 70% rule anymore. I think the 70% rule are training wheels and they're fine. I think you kind of need that when you're starting off so that you sort of stay safe. We don't use a 70% rule because it really works differently in different markets. It's not a, it's a, it's a rule. It's a guideline, right? It's like a, it's, you're throwing a dart, you're getting close, but you're not necessarily hitting the target. Um, so we, we take a much more mathematical, like analytical approach, but I've seen people with spreadsheets with like 25 variables. We don't do that. I, I'm not that insane. Right. And so we, I, I would have pulled it up if, if I know we we're going to ask this question, but basically it's ARV minus purchase price, obviously minus expenses, minus renovation, minus exactly what you said, taxes, insurance, um, cost of money. We throw in a little bit of a fudge factor, like a five to 10%. Oops. We kind of miss that thing because we don't do inspections. And so we sort of try to assume the worst and, and we don't do inspections. You might think it's because of the, the market that we're in and we're trying to be competitive. We've never done inspections, right? I think if you assume that things are going to go a little sideways and you sort of build that into your price, you can be okay. Most of the time we, we've never we've never been burned when we followed our own rules. We've only been burned once and it's because I broke every one of my rules and I, I deserve <laughs> to get burned. It was an ego play and it was total mess, but, but it, that's what we do, right? Like purchase renovation, uh, all the holding costs that you talked about, and then a little bit of a fudge factor. And then our, our profit obviously has to be built in there too. Right? So we, re- we reduce it by our profit. And then as a wholesaler, I've got to reduce it. So I have to take account the, the house flippers profit and then my profit on top of it. So honestly, most of our purchases come in the 40 to 45%, you know, or 45, you know, cents on the dollar kind of a, a range. That's pretty much where we're buying most stuff. You said 45 cents on the dollar. Yeah. About that. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. So how do we know how much a house is going to sell for it once we fix it up? Like, how do we know that? Is it just well, you, comps on something better, that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, you better know that before you buy. But in the market can change, right? But as a house flipper, uh, if you're doing it, if you're really kind of on top of it, and you're running a good business, you should have most deals. I mean, you should have most of them flipped in 90 days or less. Like if it's a if it's a real big renovation, it take 90 days, if not 30 to 45 days. But uh, the way that you do it, and I just, man, I just had this conversation yesterday with someone that I'm coaching, and she said, we were talking for a while, and she's like, and I said, you got to find the ARV, and the ARV, to answer your question, is preferably, if you have access to the MLS, that's always the most 
concrete data, right? People use Zillow, Redfin, and, and all these other things. I, I use the MLS, but we're looking for houses. And this is also why you can't necessarily rely on a realtor to give you your ARV. Because as investors, ARV is our only houses that are renovated, that are in top condition. Those are what I use for my ARV. I can't mix in foreclosures or houses that were like super dated and outdated and had issues. You can only look at houses that are in your uh, at your quality level that you're going to attain once this thing is renovated. And then, you know, you want to stay in the same school district as the house that you're going to be flipping. Cause for a lot of people, the school district really matters and changes the price. You don't want to cross uh, city boundaries, right? If you're on the edge of a city, you can't go into the next city to get your comps. Um, I try to stay away from comps of houses that are like brand new built. If mine was built in the seventies, but fully renovated, it's still different. I try not to buy on main roads, um, and, and so I try not to pull comps from main roads because again, that'll hurt the comp a little bit. So I'm looking for houses that are the same relative square footage, give or take 15%, the same style if possible, uh, in the same city, same school district, and um, at a top, you know, fully renovated. They, they look like they've been fully renovated. Those are what I use for comps. And, I'm, and it, you go out, depending on where you are, half a mile to a mile. I try not to go past a mile because I feel like it becomes a little irrelevant when you get past a mile. Yeah, I would agree. And for everybody listening, if you don't know what those terms are, ARV is after repair value and comps are comparables. Basically, you're just trying to find the exact same type of property, everything as similar as possible as the property once you have yours fixed up to be. And see, that can say, hey, it probably sold, it could sell for this, which is great. Now, how much do you account for, not sorry, that's the right, wrong way to say it. How much profit do you try to find in every property or try to make in every property? When I'm flipping here in Michigan, right, could be different, different states we shoot for 20 percent, right if the house gets up to a little bit of more or if i'm uh, if i'm going to buy a house that's going to eventually sell for three four five hundred thousand sometimes we'll go down to like 17 16 percent but we try to stay at that 20 percent. that's our kind of our watermark if we go higher great if we go lower we take a real close look at it and here here's a big mistake that i hear a lot of people make right so on let's just say for easy math we're a hundred thousand dollar arv uh we want to make twenty thousand dollars right the, the the risk and or the temptation, I should say, of a new investor is, well, shoot, I don't need to make $20,000. I'd be happy to make you $5,000. Like, that's a lot of money. And then so they build all their numbers with making 5000 And then it takes longer to, to sell. Maybe the, 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 AR, the renovation budget goes way out of whack. You find a foundation issue. Next thing you know, you're the other way, $5,000. So some, t some of that money that you're building in for your profit, that $20,000 i am talking about, you're doing it also because you realize things can go wrong that are unforeseen. And even the most experienced investors have things happen. And so you want to make sure that there's enough cushion. Yeah, 20,000 is optimal, but if something goes completely sideways and you make 10, okay, whew, we made 10, we learned a lesson there, right? But if, you, but if you plan on five, boy, you are on the ragged edge. Anything goes wrong, you lose all your profit. Help me to understand. It seems like you would figure out what you could, correct me if I'm wrong. You go to the end number of what you could sell the property for, let's just say $200,000, and then you subtract 20% of that, and that's $40,000. So you're down to 160, and then you figure out how much repair costs, you know, rehab costs, and, and your carrying costs, and you subtract that, and that's how you get to your number? That's how I get to my number. Yeah, it's just math. It's just the, 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 the situation though is two things will have a wild impact on what that final number is. The two biggest factors that will bite you in the butt are your ARV and your renovation costs, right? So what people tend to do, it's human nature, we inflate the ARV and we minimize the renovation so that we can create deals for ourselves, And then we end up being in a little bit of trouble at the end and we wonder why. It's because we're being overly optimistic in the beginning about the ARV and a little bit pie in the sky with our, with our uh, renovation costs. So those two numbers, if they're relatively accurate, I say this all the time and I say it on my podcast because it's my podcast, I can do what I want. I don't want to mislead anybody or, or upset you, but if those two numbers are accurate and you stay very disciplined, it is very hard to lose money in real estate, very hard, unless the market corrects overnight, like it did in like 08, 09, then, then okay, all bets are off. But in general, if you're very disciplined on those two numbers and you're reasonably accurate on the other ones, it's not, you can't lose money, but you almost can't lose money. It's very difficult. You have to really do something stupid. It's just not that risky when, you, when you're disciplined. I completely agree. And same thing with rental properties. I tell my students, I tell everybody on my podcast and everything, it's like, it's very hard to lose money if you do it right. 
if you're doing it right, if you're accounting for your expenses, you're accounting for how much you could rent it out for, same thing with flipping a property. Just like any business, property, real estate is literally just a product. And I like the, how you said, um, if you're going to hire a salesman, hire a, a salesman, hire somebody who can sell. It doesn't matter that they know real estate or not. They're salesmen. That's the, it's a product. It's really what it comes down to. If you could sell that product and make a profit for it, then you're going to do well. And just the nuances of learning the, the lingo. So I love the idea that as you were talking about, after we're going to be flipping a house, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're accounting for all the expenses. But at the same time, it's really hard to lose money if you follow the steps. Is there any other steps that steps or lessons that we should learn as we're thinking about becoming uh, flipping and becoming an investor? It, yeah, it's kind of a little counterintuitive, especially considering our the last 10 minutes of our conversation. But don't overthink it. You can't you can't get so caught up in being paranoid that you're forgetting something and you're gonna lose money. Cause you can talk yourself out of every single deal out there. You can totally talk yourself out of it. And so I, I do think you have to be decisive and there, there is a couple of things that we learned and some of the, I don't know how like ticky tack or how nuanced you want me to get, but I mentioned foundations. Foundations have burned us. We, we have totally uh, minimized the, the situations with foundations to our detriment because foundations, in my experience, they're a $3,000 to $30,000 problem. And, and it, you have to really think about that. Little things, I talked about my first deal. The first deal that I did, um, I didn't get all the subcontractors to sign a re, uh, like a, 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 a waiver saying that they had been paid, right? Like I didn't get them to sign that waiver, all the subs. And so I paid my general contractor. He didn't pay his subs. And I had to go back and like negotiate with the electrician and the plumber. And I was blindsided. I didn't even know what was happening. Like when I went to sell it, there was a lien, right? There were all these contractor liens. And I'm like, what? I don't understand. I paid for all of this. And I called these folks and most of them were pretty cool. And they're like, I believe you that you paid your sub. I, I do believe you, but we didn't get paid. And so we have to get paid. And so I just start negotiating. And so getting those, um, getting those waivers signed was, was huge for us. Uh, I had a $20,000 sewer situation that I didn't foresee. I didn't scope the sewers when I was, when I was buying a house and it was, it cost me $20,000 at the end of the day. So little things like that, you realize are like the couple hundred bucks you, you spend to check that stuff out is, is money well spent. And so, you know, I said, we don't do inspections and we don't do full inspections, but we have sometimes very specific people come with us on the walkthrough and just 15 minutes, check things out for us. I'll, I'll have a foundation guy. If I think there's any issues, I'll have a foundation guy come and just take a look and just ballpark it. Are we talking 30 grand? Are we talking three grand? What's that? Or, or am I just seeing something that isn't a problem? It's just settling that doesn't, it's been that way since 1950 and it hasn't changed in, you know, 50 years. Um, those are the kind of things that, that kind of burn you. I mean, there's a whole sales side of this that we could talk about. You alluded to it, but I think when you're starting off, man, there's so many impulses that you have that are wrong that you need to you need to <laughs> throttle. And one of them is to go in there and immediately you're negotiating. Immediately you're trying to beat them up on their price. I'm telling you, if you're talking about the purchase price before the very end of the meeting, and if you're not waiting till the last 15 minutes to get into it, you're screwing that up. Because to both of our points, we've said you're solving problems. You need to go in there. You need to be a listener. You need to have empathy. You need to understand their issue. You need to legitimately try to find the solution to their problems. You need to be someone who has the ability to care and legitimately try to help people. Because if, listen, we buy houses where we are not the highest bidder. We're not. But the sellers tell us, I'm not selling to anybody else but you. You're the only people I'm going to sell to, right? When you get a seller to say that, you've totally, you've done your job. They they know you, they trust you, they believe you, and you're being honest with it. Like, it's it's a great thing. And so we have investors come in and make higher offers and the seller said, hey, I had somebody offer more than you, but don't even worry about it. I'm selling to you guys. Yeah, it's because they know that you are looking out for them. You're trying to help them. And if, like you said, if you go into the deal already talking about numbers without even seeing what they need, what the seller wants, how you can help them. I found the more people I help in this life, the better my life gets and the better other people's lives get, the more money I make. Just like we've talked at the beginning of the, of the show, talking about my real estate wealth builders conference, the conference that I'm putting on, it's all about helping people. It's all about, because if you've been to any other real estate investing conference, it seems like a lot of them are like, hey, or at least the ones that you see on the infomercial at you know two in the morning, hey, come, we're coming to your town. Usually it's like, hey, now run to the back and the first 20 people, we're going to discount it to only $20,000 to come work with us, something like that. And so with the real estate wealth builders conference, it's like, it's just all of us awesome investors getting together and talking about how to invest in real estate, not looking to get anything. And we're getting people just so pumped about coming because 
we just want to help. And same thing with the seller, the lady that I'm working with right now, trying to help her with her property. It's like, how can I help you? What would you like to get out of this? And the biggest thing, like you said at the very beginning, was you're not taking advantage of people because a lot of people think, oh my goodness, you're buying it for so cheap, like half as much as it's worth. You know, you're taking advantage of like, no, I'm not twisting their arm. Like I'm not breaking their legs to sell the house to me. I'm seeing what they need and I'm giving them an offer that I can afford for my business. And if it works for them, it's going to be great because I'm helping them out. So I think that's all fantastic. Is there anything else? I will will say this too. Yeah. Let me say this too. It's, It's important to note. We, we tell people regularly when we go to their house or we have this appointment with them, if we think they're significantly better off putting a house on the MLS, we will tell them and hook them up with a realtor. Like we do not take down every house that we have an opportunity to because some people just really should be on the MLS. They really should be, right? And, and so we do that. Um, another kind of, a, this is a little bit, you're asking about flippers. So I'm kind of focusing in that area right now. But another thing that we have learned, a little pro tip that's people don't intuitively do this or they don't think it's necessary and then they get a little burned. Contractors will oftentimes shoot themselves in the foot or they will go off the rails for no apparent reason, despite the fact that you're feeding them deals, you're paying them on time, you're treating them well. They have their own little situations that are going on in their life sometimes. So it's really, really important as a house flipper because a contractor can really make or break your business, right? So it's important that you build a bench. You need to think of your of your company like a, like a major league baseball team. You need to have a farm team that you're constantly developing, constantly talking to, creating relationships, having people on speed dial that you're ready to talk to when your drywaller goes AWOL or steals all the drywall and goes to a different job or whatever they do. You need to have somebody you can call who can jump in and get going. You've already talked to them. You've vetted them. You you know their pricing. Like they, they know you. They're ready to go. Like you need to build that bench because waiting for the next contractor to find them and advertise and bring them in. You don't know if they're good or not. Like that can waste time and time is money. Holding costs are real, especially when you're in a market, you know, where house prices are three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars. The cost of money, the holding costs, all that stuff will cripple you. So you need to have someone that you can call when and if, and I, it's really more of an if, or I'm sorry, really more of a when than an if, your contractors will, will fail at some point, right? So you need to have someone who can come in and pick the ball up and run. I agree. Man, okay, so what other investing do you do? Obviously flipping, wholesaling, but is there any other type of investing that you do? Flipping, wholesaling, uh, I had rentals for a long time. I know that you're, you're jam. I j- actually just sold them off um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, I made some mistakes with my rentals. I bought a lot of rentals in sub-desirable locations and I did minimum renovations, not necessarily the cosmetic stuff to make it look nice, minimal, like major mechanical renovations that were probably too close to the end of their life to ignore. And so I had a, I had 25 properties that started having all these major mechanical issues and I knew it was just going to be a tidal wave. It was going to end up happening long-term that combined with the market situation, right? Prices are really, really high. There's more, so much equity in these houses. And the final thing, which is probably the biggest reason is I started doing a lot of lending. I'm, I've, I started a, a full, like legitimate hard money lending company. And so I was just sort of consolidating capital. So I would have that to deploy. And I was really more focused on the lending than I was on my rental. So that's why I sold them. So flipping, wholesaling, my lending company, I just started a, a short-term rental company with my daughter, which is new. We haven't bought anything yet, but we're going to build that company up this year so wow. that she can basically become financial free. It'll like, we're just going to split it. So it'll be nice for me, but um, I'm starting to do that. And um, that's really it. I mean, that's enough. It's more well, than enough. The, I probably have really got... it. I mean, you're doing like four things that people wish they did one of those. <laughs> and so Yeah. I mean, you. the only other thing that I'm doing is, and this is maybe tangent, but um, you know, I've been coaching people for a long time. I know you do too. You have your conference and I've got uh, a group of inv- uh, a mastermind that I'm, I'm an owner of, the, of that company. Um, but I've never done any like on my own coaching people. It's always been in a mastermind situation, which is awesome. But I just developed a program that I'm launching next month that's designed to teach people not how to start, not how to buy their first property, but how to build and scale a business that they can remove themselves from. Because like I said, I'm doing 100 houses a year. We're doing over seven figures. I don't spend any time in that company. Like I'm there an hour a week and, and half an hour of that hour 
is a weekly standing meeting that we have, right? And then the rest of it is like a half an hour the rest of the week where I maybe answer a question or something. So I want to teach people not how to go from 40 hours a week at a company to working 80 hours for yourself. It shouldn't be that way, right? We need to be able to build these companies and structure them and know how to hire and delegate and train and build a foundation and a structure around it that allows you to not be vital to every decision. And you can back out and you can scale your company without being a slave to it. So that's the, the program that I just built. And that's kind of where I'm focusing a lot of my time right now, actually. I love that. that and in with Master Passive Income, one of my brands that I have, I love building businesses that are passive income businesses. And it doesn't have to be like, you know, you write a song and then that song continues to sell. That's passive income for sure. But if you create a business that has other people doing work and you're not working, you're blessing somebody else with a job, being able to provide for their family, as well as you're not doing the work, but you got to, there's a lot of work building up those systems and processes in place, getting the right people in place. So that's great. Now, uh, Mike, how are people going to be able to find you? Check out this new program that you're working on and how can people find you online? So a couple of things. I, so I have a podcast like like this, similar. You were on it uh, recently. Uh, it's called Just Start Real Estate. So if you go to wherever you listen to podcasts, go to Just Start Real Estate. You can find me and you can find Dustin when, on his, his episode. Uh, additionally, uh, my program is called seven figure investor and it's the word seven spelled out. So the word seven figure investor.com, you can go and check that out. Or if you want to go to just Mike Simmons, Dot com. You can find the program there and you can find out about the podcast and everything else I'm up to. So MikeSimmons.com. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Mike. It's been great. Awesome. And I know I've learned a ton and everybody else has too. That's cool, man. I appreciate you having me. It was a lot of fun. It was great having you on my show and it was uh, awesome being on yours. So thank you for the invite.